Hello and welcome to the online service of Nambour Anglican Parish. Through this online service, we pray you find encouragement in your walk with God. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. Um, if you remember way back in uh, May, June, was it, uh, this year, uh, when we had finished with Eastertide, uh, we had perhaps Pentecost here uh, in each church, um, and then Trinity Sunday, and we entered the season of Pentecost. Uh, so since then, uh, June, July, August, September, October, and November now, uh, several months of the long season of Pentecost. Uh, but there are a couple of sub-seasons in that uh, more recent sort of introduction into the church. And uh, in September, we have a sort of sub-season of creation, and we remember nature and uh, God's gift to the world in all the uh, richness and uh, resources of nature. Uh, and then there is this month, and it too is a sub-season or is a sub-season is allowed, uh, where it is possible in some parts of the world, in the Anglican Church, to wear red uh, for the whole of the month. Um, so we'll come to that in a second. So this past month, uh, we have remembered those who have preceded us and are now at rest, all souls. And we have remembered the saints who have championed our faith and have gone before us, the All Saints Day. And today, perhaps, or maybe yesterday in parade, we remember those who have died in combat. And in a couple of Sundays' time, we will conclude the whole uh, liturgical year with the Sunday for Christ the King, the Universal King. And we remember Jesus Christ then especially, but of course we remember Jesus not only every Sunday, but hopefully through our lives and at every moment of the day and in our prayers. But we remember especially that Jesus Christ is the universal king on the last Sunday of the year, in the liturgical year, before we start again all over with the beginning of Advent. And so we remember the founder and previous members of the faith, all those who have gone before us and those who will go after us. But also we look forward to becoming fully members of that kingdom. What will that kingdom be like? Our reading from the first epistle of John, which was actually last week, tells us that we are now already children of God. What we will be like, he says, is unknown. It is yet to be revealed. So pondering about the future eternity is a bit of a waste of time. It's a mystery and will remain a mystery until we enter it. However, we can suggest a couple of things. And I want to think about rest and memory. In our Eucharist, which we'll celebrate tonight, we remember Jesus Christ in body and blood through the fellowship that gathers to share in the meal amongst ourselves. It suggests that in consuming the sacrament, we become that sacrament, the presence of Jesus Christ in today's world. We become his body and blood. We become his body and blood. Some see the sacrament of the Eucharist as a memorial, but Jesus Christ tells us in the words of the narrative of the Last Supper that this is my body broken for you, and this is my blood which is shed for you. And while Jesus' parables and stories and meanings always have several layers of interpretation, Jesus' stories always point to something more real, more eternal. So that's real enough for me. But how does the bread and wine become the body and blood? We can go down the philosophical road for definition, transubstantiation, for instance. But I don't think that is necessary. We're not called to be philosophers. We are called to be God's children, talkers and doers of the word. We are called to be theologians, both in word and act. We could search for real meat and real alcohol in our stomachs after the Eucharist, and I suspect we would be disappointed. There is something much more true going on. We become family, members of the blood, and we become members of the spiritual DNA of the body of Christ by sharing in the fellowship of the Eucharist. We remember, represent the body of Christ among us in our fellowship and in our lives. In this feast, we become the body and blood of Christ in the here and now. And what will we be? 
well, very much the same. We will become what we have already become because we are already children of God. Eventually, we will shed our physical bodies, but we will remain those whom we were created. But we have been given the spiritual life of eternity. Just as Christ took upon himself our flesh and becomes one of us and always remains one of us, so in, with, and through our divine sibling, Jesus Christ, we become the eternal in a spiritual life. But even if we still wanted to use the word memorial, it too becomes a reality more than just a memory. God's memory is so much more real than our worldly existence. In fact, God's memory is such, so much more than this mere mortal life. We remember Jesus. We present, make present Jesus to the world, remembering Jesus to the world right before us. But also, God remembers us. No matter what future we imagine, we exist in the memory of God. And that is a far more real way to exist than any other. There was a man called Anselm many years ago, sometime Archbishop of Canterbury, um, towards the, well, in the 11th to the 12th century. At 1093 to 1109, he was Archbishop. It is thanks to him that we use the words satisfaction in our Eucharistic prayer, one true, perfect, and sufficient satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. In fact, in the Australian prayer book, the phrase is used twice in the prayer, each time we use the Eucharistic prayer, just in case we missed it the first time. But he is also famous for creating the ontological argument as proof of the existence of God. Now I'm preparing uh, a variety of folk for confirmation for our um, um, congratulations and farewell to our regional bishop and our congratulations and welcome to our Archbishop-elect-to-be um, on the first Sunday in Advent uh, at our nine o'clock service when he will also confirm several folk. So I've been going over with them uh, some of the proofs of God's existence. And this ontological argument is one of them. It's quite fun. It's an intellectual sort of puzzle. Anselm proffered a way to prove God existed. He asked his readers to imagine the greatest and best being that could possibly be. Almighty, omnipotent, omniscient, all-loving, all-powerful, almighty, that sort of thing. And then he argued that if they could imagine one, then he could posit that a better one existed because one that is real and exists is better than an imaginary one. And so he proves the existence of God. Now, some folk create imaginary friends, but those who are brave enough understand that real friends are even better. A lot more work sometimes, something heartbreaking sometimes, but nevertheless much better than an imaginary one. So, though an imaginary God might be useful to talk about and theorize, a real God is so much better than an imaginary one. Therefore, a real God is so much better than of a God one can only conceive. So Anselm argued, if you can imagine one, then a real one must exist because it is the more perfect God. Now it's a, a mental tongue twister, but perhaps you get the gist. I would add, though, to that another lesson to learn by applying the ontological argument to us. So conversely, existing in God's imagination, existing in God's memory, must be so much more real than any other kind of existence because reality is better than imagination. And if we exist in God's memory, then we must exist actually, eternally. Let us do things that are worthy of God's memory. In our lives, let us be something memorable, and we will join all those who have gone before us into God's rest. Now, Jesus talked about the Sabbath, saying that the Sabbath, the day of rest, was made for humanity. Humanity wasn't made for the Sabbath. It was made for us. And he argues about this with lots of rabbis and Pharisees and Sadducees. In the first verses of the Bible, we read about the creation and how God rested on the seventh day. The first six days were days of activity, creation, living in the world and for the world, creating it. We live in the world for those six days. But the seventh day is the eternal rest of God. God invites us into that rest, God's eternity, God's kingdom. 
God's now. God remembers us in God's own memory and in his rest. We are invited into his kingdom now. There's no more real existent to be other than in the memory and mind of God. Let us enter that rest, having lived a life worthy to be remembered. Let us become the body and blood of Christ in this world, so that we, as the children of God in this world, will be of the blood and DNA of Jesus Christ in the eternal spiritual kingdom of God. Let us be the children of the blood of the one family of God. Let us be of the same DNA of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and become inheritors of the same God, the Father. It is time to make memories worth remembering so that we can rest in the eternal kingdom of God in God's memory forever. In the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen. watching today. We hope it has been an encouragement to you for your spiritual life. Please subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to support us financially, you can click the link in the description below. Thank you for joining us. God bless.